everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the short little six game main slate that we have on uh, Wednesday, uh, 31 May, last day, the second month of the season. Um, and we just keep chugging along. So we've got, uh, got a couple of guys making their, well, I guess maybe Denelson Lamette is making his first start for Colorado this year. Um, Julio Tehran making his second appearance for Milwaukee. Uh, everybody else we've got a little bit of a sample on. Cookie has been terrible um, pretty much all year. He gets Philly today. He's very cheap. He's 6400 um, And he was good in his last start, so that's nice. Um, but we've got some, some places for, I think, uh, some offense that um, we could probably get pretty excited about here tonight. Um, Toronto, certainly against uh, Julio Tehran, is popping pretty hard here in the early going. Boston against Luke Weaver down here, also popping pretty hard. And um, naturally, you're kind of getting Arizona against Denelson Lamette as well. So uh, those are really kind of our, our chalk spots um, here in the early going. As far as offenses go, uh, as far as pitching goes, uh, Hunter Brown gets the strikeout heavy twins over here. Um, he's coming in as the chalk arm, and that kind of makes sense, I think. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, George Kirby also seeing a lot of ownership against the Yankees here tonight. He normally does because he's a strike thrower. Um, he, was, he got picked apart pretty good in his last appearance uh, by Pittsburgh. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Aaron Nola down here gets a bad strikeout matchup and really doesn't have any K stuff himself anymore. Maybe starting to figure it out over his last couple of outings. Um, those have been encouraging for Nola. Also seen about 25% on him. On the cheaper end of the v of the spectrum, uh, we get Alec Manoa down here. He's been dreadful really all season. He's struggling to find it. Uh, hasn't been able to throw strikes pretty much at all. Um, Virtually every other outing, he is walking four or five batters at least. He walked seven in his last start. So, um, really, uh, really struggling down here. I think it was seven. Uh, I may be making that up. In any case, he's uh, he's pretty um, hard to stomach a full 25% of your teams here. Uh, he can't find can't find the strike zone at all, pretty much with anything that he's throwing. So. Um, Perhaps a, a spot that we could pivot to maybe a Clark Schmidt or something like that. He gets Seattle. Uh, he's at a playable price tag, and Seattle strikes out a lot. His problem, Schmidty, is really two left-handers for the most part. He's got a, a good bit of swing and miss to the right side. Um, but really, there's only two, two and a half lefties, really, um, maybe, it that we're concerned with uh, from Seattle. So... Perhaps a, a pivot spot that we can, uh, you know, come off um, a little bit of Alec Manoa. He's very cheap, certainly 6,900, right? But uh, and popping the hardest down here in the early um, value metrics, of course, right? And 215 point per dollar is pretty good. Above 30 in value score for a starting pitcher, it's pretty good. So um, all fine there. But uh, we can naturally make some pivots up at the top um, as we can pretty much all the time. Down in the bottom here, eh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we got some red numbers, a couple of guys that we will probably just want to avoid. Um, yeah, maybe one that uh, could be a little sneaky. I don't know. I, I might do it. Uh, not <laughs> not necessarily recommend that uh, anybody else do it. So that said, let's it's kind of the overview. Let's just uh, let's just get into it and talk about the games here. Um, we'll start with uh, with Milwaukee and Toronto. As I said, uh, Julio making his second appearance here. Um, he's been out of the big leagues really for the last three to four seasons. So can't necessarily expect Julio to uh, continue to um, provide the, the same sort of service, I suppose, uh, as his last outing, right? Um, he was pretty, uh, pretty serviceable. I'm trying to pull him up on the other monitor over here. Um, 
it went five innings, struck out five against San Francisco. Now, it's obviously a, a pretty favorable strikeout matchup for him. Um, but over the last several seasons for Julio, he's not necessarily been a, a whiff pitcher anymore. Uh, he's always had a, a really good sinker slider combo, stayed down in the strike zone, and given him a good few ground balls, right? Um, okay changeup. Uh, that's really kind of a pitch he's, he's tried to work in most of his career, but really kind of struggled. So um, since he has been such a heavy two-seamer guy, we've, it, in the past, we attacked Julio uh, almost exclusively exclusively with left-handers. Um, now, over the last couple of seasons uh, in the big leagues for him, he was far more attackable with right-handers as well. So uh, that's why we're seeing Toronto pop really hard here today. Um, I, I think this price tag on, on Julio is probably a, a bit uh, aggressive. So would certainly like to get to some Toronto where I can. Um, there are playable prices pretty much across the board. I mean, the guys at the top, you got to pay a little bit for, right? Springer at 48, Bichette at 5,000. That's fine for him. Uh, Vladdy at 51, a little bit better for him. Everybody else, I mean, Matt Chapman is a heavy fly ball hitter. He's been great. Cooled off quite a bit uh, in the last month, probably. But um, yeah, everybody else, uh, Springer starting to heat up and, and find it a little bit more. Pachette's been very good. Perhaps Vladdy waking up a little bit as well. Um, they're, they're very playable at these price tags, I think. And that is certainly going to pop their ownership really hard. So you're going to have to contend with that. Uh, fundamentally, I don't think it's uh, necessarily a bad spot. He's going to throw the slider a lot, though. And we've talked about Toronto struggling this year uh, quite a bit against a, a good breaking pitch like a slider. So um, this pitch usually does very well against same-handed hitters. Now he'll have to keep it, obviously, down in the strike zone. You can't get away with... Uh, you know, these kind of fly ball numbers, but, um, you know, what are we really going to take out of values or anything like that from uh, just one start sample? Not much. So I'm going to leave Tulio uh, on the shelf. Personally, like, I'm not going to be playing him, but it might take me off of Toronto a little bit. We'll see where their ownership ends up. Um, you know, as I mentioned, they're coming in at, at the moment, second most popular team to Boston. Uh, but very popular, pretty much the, the three teams at the top here, they're going to be mostly evenly spread. We'll see how, what it does throughout the rest of the day. Um, but I might come off a, a little bit of Toronto. Uh, they've been overall very disappointing, and Julio's slider here has always been a, a pretty serviceable pitch for him. So um, doesn't make him any less attackable necessarily. If I were to get to full stacks, however, I think I would prefer getting to some Milwaukee here. Um, I want to go after Manoa. Like I, I've watched pretty much all of his starts this season, and he looks completely lost on the mound. Um, he's had, what, two, maybe three somewhat serviceable outings uh, really all season. He had one about a month ago month ago uh, against Yankees he went seven struck out just five but didn't give up any production um, every start after that he hasn't even cracked 15 points and he's only approached 15 twice and he's had what was that six starts um, the strikeout stuff is is totally evaporated he's never really been a heavy strikeout pitcher um, but even still 18 percent down about four ticks to where he was last year having a lot of trouble, as we can see here, with a 15% walk rate. And uh, I think you guys know that, like, whenever I get the opportunity to go off on a pitcher, not throwing it anywhere near the plate, uh, I certainly take it. Um, Kodai Senga made me look like an idiot, finally. Uh, his first outing, where he didn't walk anybody, uh, that may very well happen with Manoa, because it seems like every other start... Um, Manoa, like I said, is, is walking a ton of batters here. Let's see, going all the way back to mid-April, really. Um, it, it has been every other start in, the last, in his last eight. 
Uh, he walks four, then he walks one. Walks four, walks one. Walks four, walks seven, walks one. Walked five in his last start um, instead of seven. So it uh, he's really struggling. None of the pitches like are providing him really any value. Two-seamer, sure. Uh, but that's going to yield a lot of power, right? That's not an equitable pitch to opposite-handed hitters when you can't keep it down in the strike zone, and he really can't. Uh, it, it floats, it, it gets up, and it gets hit really, really hard, and that's translating uh, pretty nicely here to a full 44% hard contact rate to the left side of the plate. Realized 194 ISO, hitting for a lot of average, both sides here, 277, 269. Uh, and these are slightly depressed numbers, given how much he's struggling on the mound. He's really kind of been able to hold it together for the most part. Um, you know, the ERA should probably be a good bit higher as we see the expected metrics ticking up quite a bit. But he's got a buck 80 whip. He's walking everybody. Can't get ahead in counts. He has no chase in him. So the swing and miss is gone. And he can't keep people off the base path so even with a kind of average to slightly below average offense against right-handed pitching here with the Brewers uh, I think that's a very high upside spot um, they're gonna swing and miss a little bit but again here's a five tick delta here does that mean it's an upside spot for uh, Manoa yeah, perhaps does it mean it's an upside spot for the Brewers yeah definitely um I think the Brewers will have a little bit easier time not striking out than Manoa will throwing it over the plate and striking them out, if that kind of makes sense. So um, that's kind of how I'd like to decide here is, at least in full stacks, uh, the Brewers are a lot cheaper. And the susceptibility for Manoa to really walk the whole country, I think, is, is pretty evident. We've got a much larger sample, and he hasn't been able to fix it. Um, does that mean that Julio can't walk or isn't going to walk um, seven guys himself and, and get totally blown apart? Well, no, absolutely not, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that full stacks of Toronto can't get there. So I do like the Jays, of course. They're going to make a lot of contact themselves. We saw what they did to, um, uh, who was it? Adrian Hauser last night, right? They can jump on you and jump on you in a hurry. If you're going to pitch to a lot of contact, Julio will certainly do that. But I think Manoa is also going to pitch to a lot of contact as well. And like I said, the Brewers are far cheaper. So I think this is a little bit of a sneaky stack here to get to kind of off the board. And I kind of like doing this sometimes when the chalkiest team, um, or when there's a very chalky team that comes in on a slate, I, Sometimes when there's a good matchup for it, I like going to the other side of the game and, you know, not that it works out all the time or anything like that, but uh, I think it's a viable play certainly here this evening when Alec Manoa just can't find the strike zone. So um, I really like stacking, a guys, stacking against guys that have very high walk rates and very high contact rates. So without raw swing and miss, like a Kodai Senga clearly has, um, you know, 10% lower in the in the raw strikeout rate for Manoa than a guy like Kodai Senga, but the same walk rate. So it makes him far easier to stack against. So I'd rather get two full stacks of the Brewers if I can make that happen. Uh, Yelich, I like at 4,400. Owen Miller, he's at an excellent month. He's at 31. Uh, we can get there for sure as well. Uh, Willie Contreras behind the plate. It's been fine. And Rowdy at first base back in Toronto. I think this is okay as well. Any of the filler pieces down at the bottom of the list, they're, they're fine to, to fit in in stacks. There's a couple of guys a little bit more expensive, like a Hunter Brown that we talked about, maybe a Nola, maybe a Kirby that you'd probably like to try and fit in. And the Brewers are one of the stacks that can make that happen. Um, Toronto can make it happen too, but a little bit more difficult to get there with them, uh, with the, at least the guys that you want to play at the top of the lineup. Okay, let's move on. Philly and the Mets. Aaron Nola on the mound. Ugh. All right, it's a fine price tag for Nola, right, at 91. Uh, but wh where's the swing and miss? I just don't, like, he's throwing this cutter so much to the right side of the plate, and I really don't know why. He should be throwing this to, he throws it more to righties than he does to lefties. And he still throws a two-seamer a lot. Four-seamer has really been awful to both sides. Changeup isn't giving him any value at all. Now, curveball over the last couple of starts been very good, right? Struck out 10 against the Cubs two starts ago. Struck out, what, six or seven 
in his previous start um, against uh, against Atlanta. Started, yeah, it was seven in six innings. Still gave up five runs, though. Um, so the suppression there is, like, it, it's kind of worrisome a little bit. You know, a mid-four ZRA here with expected metrics right in the same range. Tick lower, sure, but... Um, you know, the, the raw strikeout stuff just has not been there yet for Nola. Like I said, probably, hopefully, he's starting to figure it out a little bit, but he's also got to keep guys off the base paths uh, in terms of raw contact. And he's not, like, teams aren't hitting for a lot of average necessarily. It's situational, really, against Nola. And he doesn't have a lot of raw whiff stuff anymore. It's 21, 22% to both sides of the plate here. Um, so he's given up some barrel contact, 9% barrel rate for Aaron Nola is a very high number here. Um, so hopefully over the, these last two starts have been an indication that he's starting to find the break on the curveball. Um, and hopefully he stops throwing this cutter to right-handers. Like this is not a same handed pitch. It's not a whiff pitch necessarily. He, he does get a little bit of swing and miss when he starts it over the middle of the plate and it, it dives uh, over the outer third. But if, when he starts this on the middle third of the plate, it will dive right back over the heart of the, um, you know, of the middle third. So uh, that's what gives up all the power to the right side. And we see that translate to a full 222 ISO against righties this season. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. So he's not getting any ground balls here. Um, and if he's, if he loses this sinker and starts floating this to lefties as well, you're going to see the ISO balloon uh, to that side too. So um, needs to really dial this in. And is he at a playable price tag in this particular matchup? Uh, yeah. I mean, for Nola, the, the price tag is okay. Um, I don't think the owner should let... Like, if I had to look at these three figures... The price tag, the projection, and the ownership. I don't think there's anything too, too terribly exploitable that we can capitalize on. I think the ownership number is probably fine. Like, this is a six-game slate, and he's one of the top three or four arms going, really. Right? The price tag for him is fine. We like him down in this lower 9K range. Um, but fundamentally, I think he's still searching a little bit for it. And I, I really don't like that he's throwing a very hard contact pitch to same-handed hitters uh, in this cutter here and not getting a lot of swing and miss on it. So uh, it's mostly like a, a location, um, you know, not able to bury the curveball and, and start this cutter over the middle and have it tail over the outer third against righties at least. Um, it's been fine against lefties for the most part, but same sort of deal. If you can't spot it and you're spotting it on the wrong third or starting it on the wrong third of the plate to lefties or to, or to righties, um, you know, that is, it's just going to tail right back over, you know, into their kind of sweet spot in their barrel zone. That's why we see an elevated barrel rate here for Nola. So this is a little concerning. Not that I'm majorly worried about the Mets here. Uh, they're just going to a pretty bad offense, you know, all the way around. A um, couple of guys have pop. And they're hard to get through because they don't strike out a lot. But for the most part, they're super underwhel underwhelming. Um, and when Pete Alonzo and Frankie Lindor aren't hitting the baseball over the wall, like who else is going to do it? Um, you know, like Nimmo doesn't hit for all that much power all that regularly. Jeff McNeil is a contact hitter. Brett Beatty, young contact hitter himself. Starling Marte has been terrible. Uh, Danny Vogelbach, contact hitter. That sits on the bench most of the time. Um, Marcana, Frankie Alvarez, you know, all, all of these kinds of guys have um, really left it on the table here for the Mets. So they're very underwhelming in terms of um, you know, raw upside. So it's hard to get there. And that kind of puts Nola more in play for me. So like I said, I don't think the ownership uh, or the price tag are necessarily exploitable. I don't think he's underpriced. I don't think he's overpriced. Um I think the ownership is fine here on a six-gamer. So he's in play. And I think you can go after the Mets uh, with anybody that has the upside in the tank. Like we said, you know, he went seven innings and struck out 10 against Cubs. It's not the depth that's the problem for the Noah. It's just the location. So 
Um, there's been some variance. If you want to try and attack that, sure, go ahead, because he's given up a little bit of production. But again, he's going six innings, six and a third in every single start. So that's not the problem. He's still a horse, and he's still going to limit damage. Uh, he hasn't been totally blown apart. So that's good. And that, I think, keeps him in play, because I do think he might be starting to find it a little bit uh, as we round out the second month here. Um, Cookie on the other side, I uh, yikes. Um, like I said, his, his last outing was good, put up 20, but I think it was a little bit noisy in the sense that, A, he got a win out of it. He only struck out four against the Cubs and went six and two-thirds, so that's great. But this is a markedly worse matchup, I think, uh, going after the Phillies here with uh, with with Harper back now than you know than the Cubs. They've cooled off significantly of the Cubs, and uh, I think Philly's starting to kind of round into form here a little bit. Uh, we're starting to get them at some pretty cheap price tags, like Castellanos down to 4,400. I like that. Uh, Kyle Schwarber down to 4,600 starting to get into a pretty good range with him as well, even though he strikes out um, probably even against Cookie, who has a 13% strikeout rate. So I don't think Cookie is really in play here. Uh, the price tag does put him in play uh, on a six-game slate. If you need to get down here and you're stacking, uh, you know, whoever you're stacking, um, you know, Boston and Toronto or something, and you and you got to land on Cookie at 6,400, like, okay, but, like, good luck. Um, I would much rather side with the Phillies offense here than than take a shot on a, a cheap cookie Carrasco. Uh, I don't think he is going to have near the strikeout upside in this particular matchup, and I don't think the suppression upside is going to be quite there for him either, um, even if he is fully healthy. Let's not forget that he has dealt with some, some elbow problems here in the early going of the season. So... Um, I'm not super interested in it. I'd rather get to the Phillies here. They're going to be kind of down the list a little bit in terms of value and ownership because a couple of the guys that you do want to play, like a Trey, Harper, and a JTR, are a little bit expensive. Harper, though, at, at 5,800, I, I think is a pretty good play here. Uh, like I said, Castellanos and Schwarber, they make that a little bit cheaper. You can play Bryson Stott. He'll probably lead off at 4,300. Alec Bohm, if you need a first or third base piece, he's at 33. Brandon Marsh down to 2,800. He's cooled off significantly. Cody Clemens at, at first base, that's fine at 23 if you need to make it cheaper. So they're, they're a very playable stack, and you can make this happen uh, for the Phillies if you want to go after some cookie. I think that's probably yeah, – I'll try to get some. Uh, we'll see how it, it sort of fleshes out as we get into the night and I start building teams. But um, I like Philly a little bit here and going after some cookie. I want to capitalize on a lot of those variants here. He's been giving it up to righties in the short sample here. A lot of hard contact, though. Um, and that will come up against lefties as well. Even though the changeup's been very good for him, uh, the four-seamer sinker, right, this fastball mix has not been good at all. Struggling to find it, too, with the slider. So um, I want to go after a high barrel rate for him and a high walk rate that is nearly as high as his strikeout rate. So, uh, yeah, give me some Philly for sure. Okay, since he in Boston, I think we're going to get to some offense, probably on both sides here. Um, Luke Weaver, I think he's overpriced, 7,900. I don't really want to go after this necessarily. Now, he was excellent in his last start. Went six and a third, I believe, against the Cardinals. Uh, yeah, six and a third. Struck out a full six. Didn't give up anything. Um, sprayed just three hits and hit a batter. So... Really strong outing from him, but overall giving up a boatload of hard contact here in the seven starts. Excuse me, going just five and a third, so I'm worried about depth, uh, you know, if we're considering playing him. I don't want to go after Boston, number one, even though they have been pretty poor over the last week or so. Uh, they didn't really get there against um, Lively last night. They got there against a the bullpen. So... Now, both of these bullpens had to eat some last night. Uh, Brian Bayo, Reds made him work, right? He didn't have his best control. But he threw, like, 95 pitches in four innings or something. So, um, you know, both the Reds and the and the Red Sox, they had to, to eat some innings last night. So we could very well, once again, against attackable arms here. I'm still not super convinced about Paxton. We'll get to him in a sec. Um, but Luke Weaver definitely attackable with all this hard contact. Now they'd like to get a full five innings out of him, um, but they may, you know, 
Boston may be able to jump on him tonight. Uh, I think he's overpriced and really not interested in playing some of these realized um, contact numbers against a, a very potent offense still. Um, now we'll have to keep an eye on um, Alex Verdugo. He's been dealing with a sort of cold or an illness or something um, over the last couple of days. He might not be in the list. They let off uh, Raimel Tapia last night, for example. Moved Rafi Devers up to the two. Rafi is 6,100. If you can make this happen, I think you probably can. There's some mid-range arms and cheaper offenses that we can get to to uh, allow us to get to a 6,100 um, for Rafi. I think that's fine. And Yoshi is down to 55 now from the 59 in the last couple of days. More playable for sure. And everybody else is pretty cheap. I think Jaron Duran and Tristan Casas in this particular matchup at 37 and 2,800 respectively are very much in play because Luke Weaver so far, 73 hitters, really not throwing it past any of the left-handers and giving up, as we mentioned, 35% hard contact, not inducing a lot of soft really to both sides or to either side, I should say, sub 15% to the lefties and sub 7% to the righties. Um, I think it's very attackable, 194 realized ISO to the left side. So for Jaron Duran or Tristan Casas, guys that strike out quite a bit, um, I think this is a playable spot for them and like the price tag. So they'll make it a little bit cheaper and easier to get to Yoshida Endeavors. Um, so like I said, we got to keep an eye on Verdugo. He may DH or do something. Who knows what they're going to do. But if Ramel Tapia is in there again, uh, I believe he's still 21 or 2400 or, or something like that. Very cheap and, and a decent value piece. He'll pop very hard in, in, in the value scores uh, if he is once again it, at the top of the lineup. Paxton on the other side for the Red Sox. Like I said, I think we can attack him too. Um, talked about kind of being in, in wait and see mode personally with Paxton uh, after his two good starts. And then he got blown apart. I believe it was uh, Seattle um, in his last start. No, it was the Angels. Right. Um, good against St. Louis and San Diego in his first two starts, and then just went three innings, gave up five runs, struck out five against the Angels, got picked apart pretty hard. So um, this particular matchup, the Reds are a very sneaky offense against left-handed pitching. Now, they don't create nearly as much, mostly because they don't hit the baseball over the wall. But they're a neutral ground ball to fly ball here with a very high line drive rate. This is the highest line drive rate split adjusted on the slate today. And it's one of the best numbers in baseball. Uh, 25% line drives is a team aggregate, even though we're only dealing with 560 PAs here against lefties. That's a very, very high number. Um, they hit for a full 280 average against lefties. This is super, super high. Not a lot of hard contact, as I mentioned, but mostly medium contact, and it makes them very serviceable. If we're talking full stacks, they've actually split adjusted, got slightly better numbers than the Red Sox here on the other side. They'll strike out a little bit more, hit for less power, yeah, and less hard contact. But a full 5% more line drives uh, with only a, you know, a, a WRC plus here two clicks lower than the Red Sox. Um, I think... Ownership-wise, the, the Reds are they are coming in right now, at least in value score, fourth on the list, um, whereas Boston is a very clear number one, and the Reds are far, far cheaper. So similar to Milwaukee, I think this is another team that you can consider taking some cheaper tournament shots on and getting to a different expensive stack. If you want to stack this game, like go ahead. I think that's a very playable construction. You're not going to see a lot of ownership on Cincinnati tonight. They might steam a little bit as we get to more ownership runs throughout the day. But um, I think they're very playable and very attackable going after Paxton here a little bit. I'm not jacked about this price tag. I like this batted ball matchup for the Reds here. He's having a little bit of trouble walking people in and getting ahead in counts here. And these are the couple of numbers that are going to converge most most quickly in a short sample here, right? The, the chase rate at just 21% or O-swing rate, not quite chase, but, um, you know, good enough. 21% here is uh, pretty low, at least here at the early going. Now, that will take a little bit longer to converge, of course, but um, the plate discipline numbers here in the early going, like swinging strike rate, sub 10%, a lot of called strikes, yeah. I think the, the raw strikeout rate is a little bit noisy given the other 
plate discipline metrics. Just a 28, 29% CSW here uh, for Paxton here in the early going. Like I said, a full 10% walk rate, and he's been on the barrel a little bit. Barrels will take a little bit longer to converge, of course. Um, but 11% 11% in, you know, three starts. So uh, I think this is an attackable figure here, um, or profile, I suppose, with the Reds. I do like the batted ball matchup, and I really don't like the price tag on, on Paxton here. I'd like it if you were a little bit cheaper to be going after what I think is a pretty sneaky good offense against the uh, against left-handed pitching. This ballpark's going to play up, I mean, not compared to... Um, a great American, so it's not like they're going to be hitting the baseball over the wall with a, all that much regularity tonight, but it will play up offense, uh, certainly, and it's once again warm in Boston. We saw what happened last night. Game ended like 9-8 or something like that. So uh, I think the Reds are very much playable here. Um, I'll probably put Paxton on the shelf. I'm not sure the same sort of whiff stuff is going to be there against the Reds tonight. Like I said, they hit for a lot of average here. And I think that's very much attackable. Um, lower ownership, though, on Paxton, sub 20%. It's a six-game slate. I, I don't think this is horrific. Um, but I'm really concerned with this strike one rate and this low chase rate and the swing strike rate. I'm not all that impressed with it. So I think the K rate itself is quite noisy. And you can see this far closer to the aggregate 21%, 22% that the Reds exhibit against lefties. So uh, I like offense pretty much exclusively here. Maybe I'll land on some Paxton, but uh, probably pretty unlikely. I like Cincinnati. Um, okay, Minnesota and Houston. Louis Varlin on the mound, 8,300. About a two-and-a-half pitch pitcher uh, is Louis. Decent value, at least survival value, out of the changeup so far. Uh, not so much out of the four-seamer slider, the two pitches on which he ri relies most. Um at a full, what, 88% here? Uh, say 87 and a half, I suppose. Um, I, like, this is another very high barrel rate for Louie. 13%, I am pretty concerned that um, that Louie might struggle to throw it past some of the Astros here. Uh, they're very right-handed heavy, and the lefties um, that they've got in the lineup are Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker. So... Uh, they don't strike out a, a whole heck of a lot against right right-handed pitching, and they hit for a lot of power. Um, Louis's been giving up quite a bit of pop here, 45% nearly hard contact against the right side. Small sample, yeah, of course, just 143 hitters, but it, in aggregate, 40% hard contact to both sides. Um, the strikeout stuff is going to be a little bit noisy, only 47 hitters here. What's that, like 13, 14Ks? Um against lefties in the in the 47 that he's seen. So that's a good number, don't get me wrong. And that's coming from mostly the changeup. But if he's going to struggle with the four-seamer location and, and control a little bit, um, or command, I should say, and not getting a lot of swing and miss out of the slider, just a 21% aggregate K rate against the right side of the plate, he floats this over the middle of the plate a little bit, and it just kind of sits there and spins. So that's what... Uh, leads to the high barrel rate and the very high hard contact rate. Now, the homer per nine number, of course, that's going to be quite noisy, as is the raw home run rate at a full 6%. That's quite high. Um, he doesn't walk people, so it's kind of difficult to stack against him in general, but uh, he gives up a lot of contact here, and this is a very good offense. And Houston is going to be, I, I think they're the highest powered offense outside of the top three. Um, that are coming in, or top three in ownership at least, Toronto, Boston, Arizona. Uh, Houston's quite farther down the list, and I think they've got just as much upside, certainly playing at a pretty small ballpark, good homer park at least, uh, in Houston down here. So uh, I think we can go after some Louie. I'm not jacked about this price tag for him at 8300 um, I think he's probably a little bit overpriced. Would like him maybe like 74 75 somewhere somewhere around there uh then i think you could maybe consider taking some shots even on a six game slate i'm not super interested so i'd like to get to some some houston where i can uh really still not thrilled about the jeremy pena 4700 um they're really alex bregman at 4800 but they're they're very much playable and the ownership reduction that you're going to see on these guys is probably going to um account for the or you know make the those price tags a little bit more uh, palatable. So 
I certainly like Hunter Brown on the mound for them, though. Uh, 10,000. I think we can get to a good bit of this, and I think the field agrees. Um, twins against righties this season, 26% K rates, pretty high over a very large sample here. They'll create a little bit. It's mostly because they hit for some power. 182 ISO, 32% hard, and they'll walk a little bit. So they are tending a bit toward these three true outcomes, and that's really because they got Joey Gallo freaking leading off for them against right-handers. So, um, and he's his three true outcome as they come, so to speak. 106 WRC plus an aggregate for him. They are really not stealing a lot of bases. Most of their guys here are just going to walk, strike out, or hit the baseball out of the yard. And that really includes Buxton. Um, you know, When he can get on base, he'll steal here or there. Uh, but a lot of guys, uh, maybe a Royce Lewis or an Eddie Julian, they have a little bit of, um, little bit of speed. But for the most part, uh, these guys aren't going to be running. So when they create, they create with power. Uh, and, and they hit the baseball in the air. So um, that's really their strength. Their weakness, of course, is striking out too damn much. And Hunter Brown gets a, a pretty good strikeout matchup for um, for him, certainly. He's got a 20, 28% aggregate strikeout rate. He's given up a little bit of average here to the righties. Um, really needs to kind of dial this slider in, quit throwing it so much for a strike, and throw it a little bit further down in the strike zone, same with the curveball, and he'll get a little bit more swing and miss, um, and that will clean up the average a little bit. So he tails over the middle of the plate a little bit uh, with the four-seamer, and that will lead to some average. But overall, very encouraging batted ball metrics and suppression numbers. He's all he's, he's really kind of in line with um, all of the expected numbers here, for the most part, 73% strand rates, pretty good. 29% CSW, pretty good. Uh, plate discipline is is pretty excellent. Now, this may be buoyed by the back-to-back -back outings uh, against Oakland. That will pretty much do that to anybody's numbers. But for the most part, he's been very serv serviceable this season when he's getting his first full, you know, real full workload uh, in the rotation. Uh, but has really looked good. Would like to see a little bit more chase out of him, and that'll probably come as he starts to trust this changeup a little bit more to the left side of the plate. So fundamentally, nothing really wrong. Um, if you want to play some twins against this 45% ownership, though, yeah, I mean, go ahead. He's going to be far more popular than this in, in like, higher stakes and, and shorter entry tournaments, single entry three max. He'll, he'll crack 50% for sure. Um so if you want to take some leverage pieces for the Twins, I mean, this is a tournament type of team here. And as I mentioned, yeah, they're, they're going to strike out, but they're going to walk too, and they'll hit for some power. So if the control, which is really the only thing that uh, kind of troubles Hunter Brown on occasion, he starts spraying a little bit, and he'll give up a little bit of average to the right side. Um, I'm not jacked about playing a lot of the righties over here, maybe a Royce Lewis or a Correa, but, like, most of their home run hitters are from the left side. So I'm not super excited about playing the Twins. I'd just much rather just eat it on Hunter Brown, figure out how to get different elsewhere. But, like, he's 50% owned. This is a six-game slate. If you want to take some pieces uh, against the most popular pitcher there, and he's still a young arm, don't get me wrong, uh, that, I think that's perfectly reasonable and playable with, like, a Gallo or a Julian or an Alex Kirilov. Uh, Bax Kepler, 3,600. They may lead him off since Gallo strikes out so damn much. Um all, all very playable. I think it's a viable deep tournament stack. Probably wouldn't get to it in like 20 max or anything. But it's it's killer leverage uh, if you can land on the right guys that end up picking apart Hunter Brown in the event that he gets picked apart. Uh, but mostly just going to side with the Astros here. Uh, really do like Hunter Brown, and I really like the upside for him in this particular spot. Okay, let's get to the Yankees and Seattle. Clark Schmidt. We talked about it a little bit. I think he's very playable as well. 7,700. I like. I think the price tag's fine. Now I generally don't play him, um, pretty much at all because most teams are doing the platoon shenanigans, and he is awful, awful, awful against the left side of the plate. 33% hard. It, it, that's not a horrible number, but look at the average here. 354 average allowed to lefties. 441 woba. Buoyed a little bit by a 10% walk rate, but like 441 is a huge number, 262 ISO, and just a 21% K rate. He's got the swing and miss a little bit to the righties, but not so much 
to the lefties, and he doesn't induce soft contact like he would really like to uh, accomplish here with this cutter. He throws it so much against the lefties. He throws it a lot against righties, too, and it kind of convinces him that he should get swing and miss against the lefties. Um, but it's not really a swing and miss pitch necessarily, right? This is a soft contact pitch, and he's basically throwing it in the same location to um, to, to really both sides of the plate, and there's not a hell of a lot of movement on it just yet. So this pitch, this cutter sort of slider uh slurve combination is really a work in progress for him and it hasn't been all that great so generally it's a long-winded way of saying i don't play the guy all that often i do think this is a playable spot however because the mariners they strike out a crap load man um and the three guys that i would generally like to play against right handers kelnick cal raleigh um I mean, do I really want to play J.P. Crawford? Not necessarily, but he leads off. Uh, even a Taylor Trammell don't really want to play him, but he's 2,000. Um, you know, like, Kelnick and Raleigh are, are expensive here at 49, 4,800. Um, do I want to go out of my way to play that? I mean, I think the numbers against Clark Schmidt, or numbers for Clark Schmidt against lefties are bad enough that you can you can do that. It's a very high upside spot for the left-handed bats. Um and if the lefties are making it troublesome for him, some of these righties that hit righties okay, like a Julio, Ty France, uh, are perfectly playable as well. So uh, I don't think it's necessarily horrible trying to get to some Seattle a little bit here, um, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do it. I, I think landing on some Clark Schmidt at what I think is a playable ownership figure here, a playable projection, and playable value scores, point per dollar, uh, etc. I, I think this is all okay here at this particular price tag in this matchup on a six-game slate. If this were a 12-game slate or whatever, I, you know, things would change, of course. But uh, I'd probably just leave him on the shelf. Um, but I think this is an okay and, and an upside strikeout matchup for him because even these lefties here, like Kelnick, he'll still whiff a little bit. You know, Cal Raleigh still whiff a little bit. Um, so I think they're very much attackable. Certainly the righties are uh, Teoscar, Gino. And Julio, they, they strike out 25% uh, or more against righties. So I think it's very playable for, for Clark Schmidt here to get after some Seattle. George Kirby, I think, is also playable. Um, now, we saw what the Yankees did to Logan Gilbert last night. He didn't have all of it necessarily. It was probably a little bit noisy since um, Gino Suarez kind of spiked his, his pitch count um, in the first inning with an error and made him throw, what, 30, 35 pitches or something in the first inning. In any case, uh, Kirby had a similar outing against the Pirates uh, in his last start. He wasn't locating nearly as, as well as he normally does. And that will happen sometimes with Kirby. When he doesn't spot it, he pitches to so much contact because he throws so many strikes that he'll get beat up really, really good. And that's exactly what happened against the Pirates. And that will happen against any lineup in baseball. Um since he is so efficient, and since he doesn't walk people, uh, I think that's a pretty rare occurrence for Kirby in general. So I'm not my favorite going after the Yankees and playing them tonight. You can always play Judge. He's still just 6,200. Um, like he's under the guy should be 67, 6,800. <laughs> like he hits two bombs like every damn night. Uh, you can play him for sure. Um, Rizzo, we'll see. If he is back in the lineup tonight, he had a, a day off yesterday. I think he's dealing with like a back, the back issues again, or maybe the knee, or I mean, who knows? With Rizzo, um, he should be back though. He's at 4,700, and that's a playable price tag in this particular contact matchup. If you want to get there, I am not super stoked about playing Glaber at 53. Um, but if we're gonna go after Kirby. Uh, I like those are the guys you want. You want the really high contact hitters, guys that aren't necessarily going to strike out. No, Judge will strike out, but it's Judge. I don't really care. Uh, DJ at 3,400 now. He get he, what his price spiked 800 dollars in the in the last uh, two days. So, um, I think we missed the 2,600 dollar DJ train. Guys down at the bottom of the lineup: Willie Calhoun, IKF has been good recently. You're still not playing IKF on a even a six-game slate. Um, Jake Bauer, you know, all these guys can make it cheaper. They got Jose Trevino back last night. It'd probably be Higgs. 
And Volpe hit a bomb last night. Maybe he's starting to heat up a little bit uh, as we, you know, as he kind of runs or curves out of his slump, so to speak. So um, not my favorite, really, getting the Yankees. I'd much rather just side with Kirby and play him for a bounce here. Uh, I like the Arsenal still. We need more value out of the changeup. Slider is still fine. You know, it's break even here. Um, good fastball mix, and that's where the location really comes in establishment with the fastball. So um, needs to get more value out of the changeup, and that will curb the issues against left, or at least the power issues against left-handers, and a little bit of the average as well, right? Give him more swing and miss. So um, I don't really want to go after the and play the Yankees. I would rather just side with Kirby. Uh, 31% owner. I think this is fine on a, on a six game slate at 9,400. I think it's a playable price tag as well. So, uh, like I said, can't really expect him to be that bad location wise because he's so efficient generally. So, um, like getting to uh, a decent bit of Kirby really probably no offense here. I think just pitching for the most part in Seattle tonight. Okay. Let's get to Colorado and Arizona last game. Uh, Denelson Lamette. I think he's playable. At 5,100. If you need to get all the way down here, I don't think this is bad. There's some very expensive offenses that we talked about. Um, if you need to save some salary, that's really all it would be. It's not necessarily an ownership play uh, because you could just get different with a hitter. You don't have to take this kind of risk, I don't think. Um, but this is okay because he's 5,100. He's stretched out enough, even though all of his appearances have come out of the bullpen this year. He was hurt, and they sent him down uh, to AAA uh, to work him out as a starter because he's been a starter in the past, right? Back in his Padres days, he started a full season with them and has actually got pretty decent numbers, sub-4 ERA, um, and pretty decent supp suppression metrics. And with a, I think it was a 22% strike, 23% strikeout rate. So about the same range... Uh, that he is displaying coming out of the bullpen so far this season. Obviously, the walks have been a huge, huge problem for him so far. Um, so he's got to get that under control. But in his rehab start, since they've stretched him back out as a, as a full-on starter, uh, he is controlling this a little bit more. Um, he's really, all of his appearances in his career out of the bullpen have been kind of dreadful. Um, so I think he's just far more comfortable being a starter. He's typically been a, a sinker slider guy uh, that keeps him way down in the strike zone. He's moved a, a little bit more of the fastball usage over the four seamer here. Still has to develop and and throw you know a third pitch. He needs some sort of off speed pitch, um, but the slider can make him serviceable enough. And staying down in the strike zone, he can get some ground balls here. Um, so I think that's that makes him playable at 5,100 if you need to get all the way down here. Not going out of my way to do this, but uh, in if you're building a bunch of tournament teams, I think it's a, a playable price. Not necessarily a playable spot, right? It's a, it it's okay, but it, it's mostly the um, mostly the price tag here. I don't really want to play righties or a lot of pitchers generally against Arizona. I think it's a very dangerous, sneaky offense, similar to the Reds up there, like. They're not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot. They're going to hit for some average. 261 here against right hand And they they steal bases, man. They had another four or five stolen bases last night. It was against a lefty, so it made it a little bit easier. But, um, you know, they brought Jake McCarthy back up. And as long as he can get on base, he's going to steal. He's got plenty of speed. Um, you know, the guys in the middle, like uh, Christian Walker, Lourdes Gurriel, Josh Rojas, these guys aren't going to steal. Cattell Marte's got some speed, though. So we'll see what they want to do at the top of the lineup. They've had Paven Smith leading off a little bit against righties, um, you know, doing whatever platoon shenanigans that they are want to do. But I think it's a dangerous offense to go after. So that's why they're popping naturally so hard in ownership. Um, I, I'd like to get to some Arizona as well, because I'm not sure I totally trust that Lamette has completely figured out the walk problems. Um, and Colorado's bullpen, they've had to eat a lot of innings recently. I mean, Kyle Freeland only made it, what, five, five and a third last night as well. And we're getting to that point in the season where Colorado's arms just, like, begin to collapse. It's already happened with all of the injuries in their in their starting rotation. So they're piecing things together here, and they've survived to this point. But, um, you know, we might be able to start targeting Colorado's pitching staff far more regularly uh, than we have really been able to. They've been pretty serviceable, uh, to be quite honest. So... Um, 
I guess spiel aside, I, I do kind of like some Arizona a little bit here. Pavin Smith still 3,100 and very playable. Cattell Marte, of course, from both sides, 48. That's fine. 52, uh, I do like Corbin Carroll here a pretty good bit, but um, you're not going to fool anybody. He's going to be very popular for sure. Josh Rojas, not necessarily. Uh, he's 4,000 flat. He's fine in stacks, but he doesn't have a lot of power. I'd rather just get to the power upside guys like a Lourdes Gurriel, Christian Walker, um, Corbin Carroll for sure, Cattell Marte, maybe a Paven Smith. That's probably an optimal five-man, but throw in a Jake McCarthy or a Jerry Perdomo for sure, uh, or really whoever is behind the plate. Probably prefer uh, Josie Herrera, I think, to uh, Gabby Moreno. Um, so we do like the D-backs. If you can make stacks happen, yeah, go after it. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine. But like I said, I think I do think price-wise, Denelson Lamette is in play. He stretched out for a full five innings, and that's really all you need here at uh, at 5,100. Um, could he survive and, and strike out a K in an inning for five, five and two-thirds maybe? Yeah, I think that's that's well in play. And on a six-game slate, that could, uh, that could get you there. Tommy Henry on the mound for the D-backs, 5,700. I really rarely play him. He just doesn't throw it past anybody, and he has walk problems. Um, so a 13% K rate, I don't want to deal with this. I think the Rockies offense has been... Uh, pretty damn good over the last month, really. Uh, they've been scoring a lot better and a lot more efficient. And, and now against lefties in aggregate, yeah, they're they're very attackable here. They strike out a lot, but as we just talked about, like Tommy Henry's not going to throw past them. Um, they've got a lot of righties here. I think it's a plus matchup for their offense. So I think that the Rockies are also a cheaper kind of off the board stack that you can consider. Um, you know, right there with the the Reds in Milwaukee. I'd prefer Cincinnati and Milwaukee, but uh, I think Colorado is very much playable to land on here. Um, you can get a Jerry Prover. He's got a 37, 38% or, um, game on base streak. Uh, like that's that's serviceable. He's still just 4,000. He'll hit from both sides. Not a lot of power from him, but, um, you know, you need a couple base hits and a walk or something like that. I think it's very serviceable leading off. Um, we'll see what they want to do. They've been moving guys around a little bit. Like they've had Zeke Tover on the two. Um, I do believe that, uh, Charlie Blackman's still out and, uh, on their bereavement list. So, uh, he is l unlikely to be in there to kind of gunk things up in the outfield. Um, Chris Bryant really been slumping. He's down to 4,400 now. I think it's a very playable spot for him against Tommy Henry. He's going to pitch to a lot of contact, 78% here. Um, Elias Diaz, still 49, kind of hard to stomach at, at catcher piece, but uh, he's been their best hitter really all season. You know, most consistent for sure. Ryan McMahon's been great over the last week or so. Not so thrilled about um, playing him against lefties, but once again, Tommy Henry's not going to throw it past him. So uh, I, I think that's a very playable 4,500 third base play as well. 34 for Brenton Doyle and any of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Looks like they may have called up Elleris Montero again, who's been raking in AAA. Uh, he is playable at third, too, if they give Ryan McMahon a day off or something like that. Uh, he's 2,500, is Montero. So um, playable, very much so, are the Rockies here tonight. Like offense a good bit. I think the uh, is is in play just at the price tag. So, okay, uh, even for a six-gamer, I think we can still win about an hour. Um, kind of... Uh, have that in me, I guess. Um, so let's quickly go over uh, who we like. We like pretty much everybody, I think. Uh, Milwaukee and Toronto. I, I like offense here a pretty decent bit. I don't want to get to Manoa. I think the ownership is too high, and I think he's still searching for it. Um, this is one of the matchups where he he could you know suppress a little bit, but what's his upside? Like 20 points? I mean, ugh, ugh. no thanks. Uh, so offense really only here for me. Toronto definitely. You just got to balance ownership. Philly and the Mets. I like Philly. Uh, a good bit against Car uh, Cookie Carrasco here. I don't want to play him, even though he's very cheap. Um, that's a playable price tag for him, but I don't want to go after Philly. I like Nola, too, here a little bit. I, I mean, I guess. Uh, I don't like going after the Mets generally, but Nola's one of the higher upside arms on the slate. So, yeah, sure. Uh, since he and Boston, I like offense pretty much exclusively here. I don't, I'm going to play the wait-and-see game still with Paxton. I think the Reds are very sneaky, and I think he's a pretty high upside spot for them. They hit for so much average against left-handers. Um, and yeah, Boston, sure, against Luke Weaver. He's given up a truckload of hard contact to both sides. Minnesota and Houston, maybe some Minnesota pieces as leverage against Hunter Brown, but um, for me, I'm probably just going to eat the Hunter Brown and, and hope it doesn't blow up in my face. Uh, same thing with Houston. I think Houston is a really kind of down-the-list stack here, 
And going after Louis Varland, um, he's only got about two, two and a half pitches, and really none of them are all that impressive. Gives up a lot of hard contact himself. So uh, I like getting to Houston here. Uh, Yankees in Seattle, pitching only, I think, for me. It's kind of how I'll focus on this late game. Like Kirby a, a pretty good bit at 94. Um, and Clark Schmidt, too, at 77. Very playable price tags for both of these guys. Colorado and Arizona, once again, mostly just offense, but Lamette is very playable at 51 if you need to get down there. So that's it, guys, for the main slate. Um, good luck. Once again, keep an eye out for projections and uh, ownership updates as we will push those throughout the day. Uh, we do have early slate projections up already, so for premium subs, feel free to uh, navigate uh, over to the early projections uh, and use those. Load them into your favorite optimizer. So good luck, everybody. Uh, we will catch you probably for another getaway day split slate uh, tomorrow.